Good day, and welcome to Building on the Rock. I am Pastor Chris Turner, the pastor of Rock Tabernacle Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Today, we're going to get back into a teaching that I began several weeks ago. We're talking about faithfulness. Faithfulness. The word faithful means trustworthy, reliable, and dependable. God is faithful. He's the faithful God. He's trustworthy, he's reliable, and he is dependable. Amen? But we are talking about his faithfulness. We're talking about your faithfulness. Are you faithful? Are you trustworthy? Are you reliable and dependable? Can, can you be counted on, amen, and, or, and to be faithful and to be obedient to the Lord and follow him in faithful obedience? Because if you can, if you are that, that faithful person, the Lord says your life is going to abound with blessings. And you're, you're that, that rare person that God's looking for because he says, when I find a faithful man, uh, he said, uh, I'll show myself strong. If his heart is committed, loyal, that word, uh, perfect, uh, a man whose heart is perfect toward him. Uh, it, that word perfect means committed, loyal, dedicated, and faithful. God said, I will show myself strong on his behalf. That was 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. I kind of paraphrased it there. But, uh, but is that you? Are you faithful? Has God found you faithful? Amen. Can God depend upon you? And when he finds a faithful person, he will increase them. He will promote that person. He will give that person great responsibility, greater responsibility, greater influence, greater anointing, greater uh, uh, giftings, finances, whatever he wants to use to bless through your life, he'll give you more of. He'll promote you to higher places. But he doesn't promote you just because you're gifted and just because he loves you. He promotes you when, you're, when you prove yourself faithful. And he's always looking and he's always giving opportunities to people to prove and show themselves faithful. And he, he gives you the opportunity by placing you in a small place with, with something small and watching how you handle that. You're being watched today by the Lord, and you're being watched and proven for promotion, for the sake of, for the purpose of promoting you and bringing you somewhere higher, amen? We've been talking last week about the rewards of faithfulness. God wants to reward and will reward a faithful person. He'll reward you in heaven. There's a heavenly side, but thank God for heaven, and it is what it is, but we're not talking about heaven. There's an earthly reward for faithfulness. God said there are blessings and rewards that you'll receive in the earth just because you're faithful that otherwise you would never ever see manifested in your life, even though God has them for you and God wants you to enjoy them and have them show up in your life. Uh, they don't show up in your life until you are proven faithful in certain areas. Glory to God. And so that's what, that's what he's after. But, um, but those rewards, they come to you. And we, we showed last week, I began to talk about last week, the fact that, that uh, God won't always tell you what he has in mind. When he gives you instructions, he tells you to be obedient to me. He gives you an opportunity to obey him and to, and to be faithful in, in a certain area. He doesn't tell you and show you what he has in mind by way of how big the blessing is that's going to show up in your life because of it. He keeps that to himself because he's just giving you an opportunity to, to, to position yourself for something good, but he doesn't show you the, how good it is. And then whatever you're believing God for, that's good. I guarantee you God has more on his mind and he has bigger on, your mind, on his mind than you do for you. Amen. His thoughts are bigger than yours. His, his thoughts and his plans for you are so much bigger and more grand than even what you have asked or thought or believed for. Amen. But once again, what gets you there is when you're obedient to the Lord. You know, we said last week that you need to be obedient to the Lord. Obedience needs to be right away. Obedience needs to be all the way. And obedience needs to be done in a happy way. That's when the Lord shows you something in the word, obey him right away. Obey him all the way and obey him in a happy way. It means you, your attitude is right. Or when he prompts your heart to do something, it shows you in your heart, leads you in your heart to do something. Obey him right away. 
Don't let God have to tell you for six months to do something and lead you and, and, and deal, quote unquote, deal with you for six months before you obey him. Obey him right away. Obey him all the way. Do it completely, amen? And do it with a good attitude. And then when you do that, you position yourself for, for higher blessings and blessings that, that you never even thought you would have and, 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 and enjoy, amen? And I was gonna give you a couple of examples from the word of God. I wanna give you one about some people that God told them to do things, and but didn't tell them all that he had in mind, but it was a whole lot bigger. We, we can look back and that when, when they carried out when they obeyed God, they found out and they saw something bigger that God had in mind. Or they didn't obey God and they saw they missed out on a whole lot more than what they knew. Amen? See, there's a, the flip side of that is true, too. If you obey the Lord, the blessings are bigger than what you thought they, they would be. But when you disobey, when you're not faithful, you don't carry out faithful obedience, you miss out many times on things that you had no idea that God was trying to get into your life, that God was trying to position you for, to receive. Amen? And so we'll give examples of both. But the first example we'll give is from the life of Abraham. You remember Abraham? We call Abraham the father of faith. The Bible says that those who are uh, of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. God called Abraham faithful Abraham. He called him faithful. He, God says, He's, this is a man that I can depend upon. This is a man that I can rely upon that is trustworthy. And the Lord proved him. It wasn't just something that God said because he knows his heart. It was something that God proved in Abraham's life. God proved that this man would be faithful. And be, when he proved that, that's when God was able to bring blessings in his life beyond even what Abraham ever asked or thought or dreamed that he would ever have. The example I'm talking about is... is uh, I'm thinking about is in Genesis chapter 22. Now, you know, this is years earlier when God first met Abraham when he was 75 years old and God made certain promises to him. He made a covenant with Abraham. Abram at the time was his name. It changed to Abraham later on. But at the time when he first, when God first introduced himself to Abram, he was Abram and he, he was living in a certain place called Ur of the Chaldees and God you know, told him to move gave him instruction, Abraham obeyed and, uh, and went not knowing where he was going, but, but, but God began to bless him and increase his life, multiplied him, blessed him financially uh, with wealth. And he became a, a very great man but that walked in covenant with God. He walked, it protected him, blessed his family, did a number of things. And one of the things that he did uh, in Abraham's life, Abra Abraham's life at this time, was with, uh, he allowed him and his wife to conceive a son, Isaac. And he did it when Abraham was old and, and wasn't able to do it a tip to produce a child. His wife, Sarah, had always been barren. She had never had ki children, but God had promised him children. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of giving you a very abbreviated story of Abraham's life, you know. But, uh, but finally, this miracle child comes, and he's born, and his name is Isaac, and he grows to a certain age. He grows to be a young teenager, and it, it, this is where the story picks up. So Abraham has a miracle son, Isaac, and when, he's, when Isaac's a, a young teenager, this is what God says in Genesis chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. That word tempt right there does not mean to entice to sin, but it means to, uh, to prove, prove. God did prove Abraham. God said, I have to prove you. Amen? There's a proving. I want to prove some things about you. Amen? So God did prove Abraham, and he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee to a land of Moriah and offer him for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. So here, Isaac is a teenage young man. This is the miracle child, the promised child that Abraham has with his wife Sarah miraculously. And uh, God says, now, now I want you to sacrifice him to me. I, I want you to give him to me. I want you to take him to a mountain and I'll show you. And I want you to make him a burnt offering. 
I want you to kill him, stab him, let him bleed out, then I want you to burn him to ashes. Give him to me. Well, uh, it, it, this is what God told Abraham to do. Now, Abraham's walking in covenant with God. God had, if you're walking in covenant with, with another person, and you're walking in covenant with God, God has a right to ask you for anything. And like if, if but, uh, to, and to expect you to follow through and to obey and, and to give it. And so Abraham didn't, and God didn't explain what he was going to do, why he was asking him to do this. He just told him to do this. But look at what the Bible says. Verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning. I like that. We talked last week about how obedience needs to be done right away. All the way and in a happy way. Abraham didn't dwell and ponder about what God said for six months and say, well, God, keep dealing with me. And God dealt with me for six months. No, when God told him to offer your son Isaac, offer him to me. The Bible says Abraham rose up early the next morning and he went to go to do it. He saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood of, for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. So they, they walked for three days. And to find a place where God said, sacrifice this boy. Verse 5 says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, with the donkey, and I will, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come to you again. And verse 6 says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a kindle and a knife, and he went both of them together to the place where he was to offer Isaac. Now, that, that's pretty outstanding that he was willing to do that. He was willing to obey and to offer and to offer Isaac. And, you know, the, as the story goes, he got Isaac up on the altar and laid him there. And like I said, once again, Isaac wasn't a, wasn't a child. Isaac was a young teenage, young, young man at the time. But Isaac was a willing sacrifice. He, he willingly obeyed his father. That's, that's, a, that's a teaching right there in itself. That Isaac had enough confidence in his father Abraham's faith that, that he was going to obey his father even when his father said, I'm about to sacrifice you. And, but anyway, so, so Isaac gets up on, that, uh, up, on the, uh, um, up on the altar there that it was made there and they got the wood and prepared the burnt offering and Abraham you know the story that Abraham raised a knife and was beginning the, the, getting ready to offer his son Isaac and Abraham stretched forth his hand reading, pick up reading in verse 10 stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said unto him Abraham Abraham and he said here am I and he said lay not thine hand unto thy lad Neither do thou anything to him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Do you hear what the angel said? He said, don't kill him. Abraham had the knife up and was about to plunge it into him and, and kill him. And he said, don't do it. He said, but now I know. Now I know. It sounds like that God was investigating. It sounds like God was gathering evidence. We said it before about our faithfulness that that um, that it's when Paul said it's required of a steward that he be found faithful. Found in, implies an investigation has to take place, and a finding has to come after evidence has been gathered. And God was gathering evidence about Abraham about something. He was gathering evidence to see if Abraham would truly be faithful, truly be obedient, if he would truly follow me and give me anything, even though I didn't explain to him much, I didn't tell him all the details of what I was doing, I just asked for it. Would he really walk in this covenant with me, even to the extent of giving me everything he has and the most precious thing to him, his son Isaac? And the answer was yes. And the angel said, now I know. That's all I was after. I just wanted to know. Well, you know the story, how the story goes. He took Isaac. When the angel said, don't kill him, 
they took Isaac off the altar. They found the ram in the, in the, in the, in the bush there, and they took the ram. He became the offering, and he slew the ram, and he became the sacrifice. And, and that right there, Abraham didn't know it. He knew it later. He knows it now. We couldn't tell. We can look back now and see what God was doing. Why God had Abraham do that? He had to know, God had to know that he had a man in the earth that was faithful to him, that would actually truly walk in covenant with him, that would give that would give God a doorway back into the earth. See, Abraham, God was, you know, shut out so much uh, of, of mankind's uh, relationship with, with Adam when Adam sinned. God was shut out and was on the outside while the devil was on the inside with, 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 uh, with Adam and Adam's descendants. Now, when God's on the outside with his creation, he had given Adam dominion over the works of his hands. But, but now Abraham was to be the door for God to get back in the earth. If I can find a man who will walk in covenant with me and give me everything, even his most precious Thing that he has, which is his son, God says, then I can legally, see, this is legal, then I can legally come into the earth and I can give to that man everything I have. He was willing to give me his son, God says, therefore I can legally give my son, Jesus. No, God's son, Jesus. Abraham was willing to to, to put his son upon an altar and sacrifice him and kill him and make him a complete offering, God says, that's what I needed. I needed someone who would do that so that now I can legally offer my son upon an altar, which is the cross. I can have him killed. Amen. When Abraham was about to kill Isaac. The book of Hebrews says that Abraham had, all, book of Hebrews chapter 11, says that Abraham had already received Isaac raised from the dead in a figure. Hear that? Abraham expected God to raise Isaac. Abraham said, listen, okay, God, he thought to himself, okay, God, my covenant partner, my covenant God in the earth, he's asking me for something. He's telling me to obey him and to do this what he's asking me to give, my son. He wants me to kill him, give him as a burnt sacrifice, to kill him completely and burn him. Well, God must be going to raise him from the dead. And Abraham had released his faith that, bless God, if I do kill him, if I do burn him, then God has to raise him from the dead there because that's the seed of many nations. That's, that's my promised child. And he can't be the seed of many nations if he's killed and burned to a crisp. So God must be going to raise him from the dead. God says, now, look, I have a man in the earth that is not only willing to give his son upon an altar, not only willing to kill his son, but he's willing to have, he's willing to exercise his faith in the earth that his son will be raised from the dead. So now God says, legally, I have the right to Bring my son, Jesus, in the earth, put him upon an altar, have him killed, and I can exercise my faith for the resurrection of my son. Why? Because my covenant friend, my covenant man in the earth, he did it, and he opened the door for me to do it. And what God was just doing was sewing up mankind's redemption. He was, he was establishing a legal right to, to redeem mankind through Jesus, his son. But he did it in Abraham. He did it through Abraham. He was able to do it because a man in the earth allowed me to, to, uh, to, to give him a commandment. I didn't explain to him, but he was going to follow me to his conclusion, and he was going to do what I said do. Therefore, I can do what I need to do now by sending Jesus. Now it was legal for God to send Jesus into the earth. This is astounding to me because number one, Abraham didn't know any of that. All Abraham knew was that God told me to give my son. God told me to do this. And God said, I didn't tell you that right now, my whole plan of redemption, Abraham, is hanging on you. If you say no to me, 
You will forever shut the door in my face to, to, be, to redeem my man, to redeem mankind forever because legally I can't do it because, because it's not a question if God would keep the covenant, but there was always a question is would a man keep the covenant? Would a man walk in strong covenant with me to allow me to become a God to him and to bless through him all the earth? And the answer now is yes, Abraham did it. Abraham had no idea that all that was hinging on what, on, on his act of obedience, his willingness to give his son. There's a reason why he's called the father of the faith. There's a reason why Abraham, heaven is called Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is, is heaven. There's a reason why those who are blessed are blessed with faithful Abraham. There's a reason why God called him faithful Abraham. He was faithful and obedient to God and not knowing, not knowing all what was riding on his decision of obedience. Listen, child, I'm making this point. You don't know all that's riding on your obedience. Things that God's told you to do. Things that God's leading you to do. He, he, he might give you an instruction or a, 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 a a, a command to do something, prompt you in your heart to do something or give something or, or what. He might ask for your Isaac. He's not going to ask for your Isaac, your child. He, we don't do child sacrifices and, and we're not, not asking, you're never going to ask for that. But he might ask some, for you to give something precious of your life to give it away or to, or to sow it, to give it, to, to give it up. Right. What you going to do? Obey him. Obey him. Because I guarantee you, you might not know, and he might not, he most likely will not explain to you the reasons why he's telling you to do something. Like he, he didn't tell Abraham all the details. Abraham distrusted him. And, but when you show him that trust through faithful obedience, you, there's no telling what God will open up to you. Abraham is now, bless God, he's the seed. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Think of the honor of that, that the Messiah, Jesus, is actually called, he's the seed of Abraham. And if you be Christ, you're also the seed of Abraham. But it was opened up to the whole world because a, a, a man in the earth would, was faithful and obedient to God. And God was therefore able to bless him in ways that Abraham never, ever dreamed that God would take him and dreamed that God would do for him. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. So, anyway, once again, bless God. He is, he might, if he, if he uh, obey the Lord, if he doesn't show you and reveal to you all that he has in mind, that, that's, that's part of the plan. It's part of the, it's part, it's, it's, it's necessary because he needs you to trust him enough to pass this test of faithfulness and obedience so that I can open up for you blessings that you never, ever dreamed possible that God would do through you and in you. Glory to God. Amen. Let's talk about another example of a person that just through faithful obedience, faithful obedience, this, this example is a man who missed out on some things. See, because Abraham was an example of, of being obedient, but the man we're going to talk about next is an example of, of a person who was not faithful. A person who was not obedient, he was not faithful, and because he was not obedient and he was not faithful, he missed out on some things that God had for him and that God wanted to do for him. And this man's name was, is, is, is the king, his name's Saul. Saul, King Saul, the first king of Israel. And when I, when I mention Saul to many people, King Saul, the first thing they think is that, well, King Saul was a bad king. King Saul was a bad king. And, uh, and God gave Israel a bad king. And you know what? Well, actually, I, that's not true. King Saul was not a bad king. I'll put it this way. King Saul did not start out as, as a bad king. When God found Saul, God said this about Saul to the prophet Samuel. He said, but the day that I chose you to be king, God chose Saul king. Saul to be king. And God didn't give Israel a bad king. He said, the day that I chose you to be king, there was not a more humble man in all of Israel. That's what God said about Saul. He said, you were small in your own eyes. You were little in your own eyes. You were small. You were humble. That's what attracted God to Saul in the first place when God was looking for a king. 
So he found this man, Saul, and he made him king. And Saul was a man of faith. Saul was a man of faith and, and who, who did great exploits for God and through the nation of Israel's armies and did great exploits in, against the enemies of God through faith. But he ended bad. He turned wrong. He turned bad. He lost that humility and he began to do a number of things in his life and that, that, that revealed that, that he wasn't the humble man that God had chosen. And it, it changed. And when it changed, God called him out. And, um, and, uh, and, and Saul never repented. Saul never humbled himself. You know, David made some mistakes too. David was the next king. But David made a lot of mistakes too. But David was humble enough to repent to make some adjustments and change, but Saul never did. And so, so Saul just missed out on some things. And so there came a day when the prophet Samuel came to Saul. And this was after uh, Saul had done something that was very, very bad. And uh, I'm going to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. What Saul had done, which was uh, he was going up against the Philistines. The Philistines had, had uh, come to a certain place to do battle with the people of God. And Saul's the commander in chief, and uh, but 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 they were waiting on the prophet Samuel to come because Samuel was going to make a burnt offering. He was going to make a sacrifice so that they would be successful as they went out to battle. Uh, the people of God would be successful when they went out to battle against the Philistines. And Samuel had promised that I'll be there in seven days. Saul, so wait for me. I'll be there in seven days. And so seven days came, and Samuel didn't show up to make the sacrifice. So Saul said, forget it, I'll make the sacrifice myself. So he called for, a, for an offering. He made a burnt offering and a sacrifice, which was something that only the priest, uh, the prophet priest was supposed, Samuel was supposed to do. But, but Saul just did it in, in pride in himself. And when Saul came to town, Saul came right afterwards and said, here I am. And he saw that the sacrifice had been made. And he said, what have you done? And I'm reading from 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 13. And then this is what Samuel said to Saul. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy throne and king, and it, uh, thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. This was it. Saul, you, you, you've blown it now. And God says, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. You've done this great act of arrogance and pride and disobedience. And he said, you've done it unrepentantly. And so he said, I'm done with you. He said, I found a man better than you. Amen. So this is when Saul was rejected as king. Amen. Saul was anointed as king, but now Samuel says, Saul, you are being rejected as king. But it is because of his disobedience, unfaithfulness, amen, he wasn't faithful and, 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 and obedient to the Lord the way he was called to. But Saul didn't know what all he missed out on. And, and I read this years ago, and, and, and when I saw it, and it dawned on me what the prophet said to him. I, I said, I, my mouth fell open. I said, what? Look at what he says here. Look at what Samuel said to Saul when he rejected him. He said, um, verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept thy commandment, the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Samuel said, Saul, if you had obeyed the Lord, if you had been faithful to obey God, he was going, he intended to make you king to establish your kingdom, to establish your throne in Israel forever. Forever. And when I saw that, and the Lord gave me an understanding of what that meant, I said, wow. God intended. See, there's only one way. God said, I was going to, I'm rejecting you as king today, but my intention, if you had obeyed me and been faithful to me, I was going to establish your throne 
forever in Israel. There's only one way for God to establish Saul's throne in Israel forever. That would be for Jesus, the Messiah, to come through Saul's lineage. Did you hear that? God said, I intended for your kingdom to be established in Israel forever. Now, there is a man that God said who came after Saul, his name was David, who his kingdom is established in Israel forever. He's, his throne is established now in Israel forever, David's is. But God said, I intended it for it to be Saul. I intended for it to be Saul. In other words, Jesus, the Messiah, was supposed to come through the lineage of Saul. That's what, that's what the prophet said to him. I was going to establish a throne in Israel forever. Saul didn't realize that his unfaithfulness and disobedience was not just something that stopped him from being king in Israel that, that you know, uh, currently, but God had eternal blessings. God intended to bring the Messiah through your lineage and to have him sit upon the throne of Saul forever. Jesus sits upon the throne of who? David. David. David was a man that was better than him, that God said, I'll bring me a man better than you. He'll obey me. He'll be faithful to me. And because of, because of his faithfulness, faithless obedience, I'll establish my throne in Israel in his uh, kingdom forever. Jesus sits upon David's throne. But God intended his first choice was Saul. That was astounding. I said, Lord, I, Saul didn't realize what his disobedience was doing. He didn't realize all that he was going to walk away from and forfeit and miss out on because he was disobedient to the Lord. He was unfaithful. And many times you don't know what you will miss out on. Think about that. When, when people would, when Jesus came along and Jesus was born of the lineage of David and he came and lived and grew up and began to minister, people would say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Remember that? What they should have been saying was, Jesus, son of Saul. God intended for it to come through Saul. God intended to bring his Messiah through Saul's lineage. Did he? No. Why? Saul's disobedience. Don't, don't miss out on blessings that God didn't tell you about. Saul didn't know that before, but God had it in mind. Don't miss out on something grand and big and eternal, maybe, that God has in mind for you if you will just be obedient where you are. You don't know where God will take you. You don't know what's, what's on the furthest end, the other side of that thing amen, that God has. You don't know how big this thing is. And God's, he doesn't tell you to do something. He doesn't tell you to be faithful. He doesn't tell you to obey me here and be loyal and faithful. But he won't tell you all the big things that I have in store if you just follow through with it. Oh, don't miss out. I don't want to miss out on something eternal that God has for me. Like Saul missed out on eternal. Well, Abraham got in on it because he was faithful. Saul missed out because he was unfaithful. Glory to God. Let me give you another example. This is another example of a person who missed out on some things. He missed out on something that God had for him that was bigger than what he ever had imagined. And this, is, this, this guy is over in the New Testament. I'm going to turn to the New Testament. So we're giving examples of, of how they, the Lord would instruct obedience and faithfulness to, from, from you, you know, required from you but he doesn't tell you how big the blessing is that he has in mind for you you know in in the book of mark in the book of mark chapter 10 there's an account that i'm going to turn to this is another man who missed out in the book of mark chapter 10 in verse 17 Mark 10, 17, I begin to read here. It says, And when he was gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said to him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, 
sell all whatsoever thou hast and give it to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up a cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had much possessions. This is a story or account of the person that we call the rich young ruler. Came to Jesus, this man was came to Jesus, asking him about eternal life. And Jesus is giving him instructions. He said, well, you know, to, to keep the commandments, right? What are the commandments? What does the word of God say? He said, I've kept the commandments. And Jesus looked at him, the Bible says, and he loved him. So Jesus wasn't rebuking him. or He wasn't like, he, he, this man wasn't insincere. This man was sincere. And he said in love, you lack one thing, young man. I want you to do this. I'm going to give you an instruction. Are you going to obey me? I want you to go your way. He was rich. I want you to go your way and, and sell all that you have and give to the poor and come follow me. And he didn't explain him anything else. Just, just, just do that. And the Bible says the dude, dude wouldn't do it. He went away, wow, sorrowful. He went away grieved he, because he had much possessions. Actually, the possessions had him. And, you know, there's a lot of misteaching, wrong teaching about what Jesus was saying to him. Some folks say, well, you know, he couldn't go to heaven because he was rich. And Jesus was trying to get him out of this, out of that money. And, oh, oh, God help us. No, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. It, it, Jesus was trying to, Jesus saw one thing about this man that, that, was, that was needed to be corrected, needed to be adjusted. He wanted to get this man's trust out of his money and over into the kingdom. He said, you only lack one thing. But he said, but if you want eternal life, he said, do this. He said, sell all you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Come follow me. And I'll give you treasure in heaven. Well, the man didn't do it. He didn't obey. And he walked away. And we have no record in the Gospels that he ever came back and ever made the adjustment, ever did obey Jesus. He just walked away. But what did he walk away from? He had no idea what he was walking away from. First of all, Jesus wasn't trying to take his money. Jesus wasn't trying to get him to be poor. Jesus wasn't poor himself, actually. <laughs> That's a different teaching, but Jesus was not poor himself. And he wasn't trying to get this man to be poor and come follow poor me and we all be poor together. Jesus was trying to get this man to be transfer your trust over into the kingdom and look down here at verse 28 at what, what Jesus had in mind for him. Look at what he said and had in mind for him. Because Peter heard the whole conversation. And Peter, uh, you know, because Jesus had talked about uh, uh, how that uh, it's hard for a man to enter into the kingdom if he trusts in his wealth, trusts in his money. Peter in verse 28 says, Then Peter began to say to him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you. This is what Jesus had in mind for Peter and his other disciples. But this is what Jesus had in mind for that rich young ruler. He said, I very I say to you, there is no man that have left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and for the gospels, but that he should receive an hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. You hear that? Jesus revealed the hundredfold return, the hundredfold reward. And Jesus said, there's no man who's left anything. If I told you to give something and, and want you to give it up, Jesus said, my intention is to give you a hundredfold more of what you had, of what you gave up. And Jesus was going to teach this man how to prosper in the kingdom, how to prosper that way in the kingdom and receive a hundredfold reward. But Jesus couldn't. You know why? Because he wouldn't obey. He walked away sorrowful and wouldn't obey. Little did he know that he was walking away for, from so much more than what he had. Jesus said, I would have given you a hundred times of what you've had. Plus, it, when, when, when? In heaven? No. He said, you will receive it now in this time, verse 30. He should receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions, and in the world will come eternal life. In other words, Jesus said, you're going to have a, an, an eternal blessing waiting for you in heaven, but you're also going to have some, some, some blessings for the here and right now if you disobey me. He didn't tell him all that. 
He told him, he's, he told Peter later on, but this man was given a test, an opportunity to be obedient and to be faithful. And he walked away from it. And he walked away from that, the hundredfold return. But something bigger he walked away from. Do you ever think about this? Read the Gospels. Anybody that Jesus ever asked to leave everything and come follow me, he didn't do it to everybody. He didn't tell everyone he came along with, he came along, he came, he met. He didn't tell everyone that he met to leave everything and come follow me. In fact, some folks, he said, don't, don't follow me. You can't just stay where you are. Go back to your hometown. Go back here. But, but certain people, he said, leave everything and come follow me. The people, every person he ever told to leave everything and come follow him also became eventually one of his apostles. One of the apostles of the Lamb. Those were the only ones that, that, that he asked to leave everything and come follow him in his earthly ministry. This rich young ruler, I believe, I strongly believe, was being called. He didn't know it, but he was intended, God intended him to eventually be one, become one of his apostles. Most likely, Judas's replacement. You know, Judas, when he betrayed Jesus, and then he went out and hanged himself, and he died, and he missed out on his apostleship. Well, he had to be replaced. I believe this rich young ruler was possibly supposed to be the one to replace Judas. But he walked away from that too. He was sincere. When he came to Jesus, he called him good master. He was sincere. He, he fell on his feet. He wanted to serve God. He wanted to do, he wanted eternal life. He knew there was something about Jesus that was, but when Jesus told him to do something, he wouldn't obey him. And because he didn't obey him, he missed out on the hundredfold that Jesus had for him that Jesus would have personally taught him how to walk in, and he missed out on the apostleship, the calling that God had for him. Can you see how you can miss out on some things just by not being obedient? You can see how that God will tell you something to do in obedience, and he doesn't tell you the end. He doesn't tell you why he tells you to do it. He just tells you just to do it. Just obey me. Just obey me. Do what, do what I say do. Uh, it's the same with you. God's not going to explain to you the blessings on the other end of your acts of obedience. He'll just tell you, be obedient to me. Obey me in this. Do this. Give this. Follow me here. Obey me over here. And he won't tell you all, the, all that he has in mind. But I guarantee you, if you don't obey, many times you're walking away from a whole lot more than what you ever imagined or ever dreamed you would ever have. Be faithful. Be obedient and be faithful. Be obedient and be faithful. Because God's got bigger thoughts on his mind than what you're thinking about right now. He has bigger plans for you. He has bigger blessings for you than what you can even imagine would ever come into your life. You know, I'm going to tell you about one more person real quick. His name was Paul, the apostle. And you know Paul, the apostle, and you know, just, he's a man who's faithful to the Lord. And you know, Paul went through many, many persecutions, many, many hard times, and, and he always, you know, he walked by faith, and he, you know, walked through those things, never never betrayed Jesus, never gave up on his faith. Man was beaten many times, stoned, shipwrecked, thrown in prison many times, thrown in prison more than once. You know, whenever he was, you know, a, a, one time when he's thrown in prison, at least one time, you know, the first time, you know what Paul did? Instead of sitting there and being discouraged and crying and complaining and, and, and grieving about how bad he had it and how bad because my back is hurt and they've been beating on me now and this and that. You know what Paul did? Paul decided to write some letters to the to the churches that he had established. So write some people some letters. And he wrote a letter to, to, to the Ephesian church one time when he was in jail. And the Colossian church. And to the... To the to, uh, uh, Philippian church. He also, uh, second time he was in prison, he, there he, in Rome, he, he wrote uh, some letters to Timothy. Wrote a letter to Timothy. And, you know, people, and he's, just, he's just being faithful. Even though I'm in prison, and I don't know, and I, I'm falsely accused me sometimes, or I'm, I'm you know, trying to, try to you know, stop me and, and falsely accuse me and, and kill me, I'm going to stay positive. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to stay 
and, and stay faithful to the Lord. I'm, I'm going to stay faithful and just, and I'm just going to use this time just to write letters to people, write letters to the church to encourage, it, to encourage them. You know, Paul had no idea that he was writing letters that would now make up the canon of Scripture that 2,000 plus years later we're still reading. We're still reading letters that Paul wrote to the churches while he was determined just to be faithful to the Lord, even while he was in jail. Hear that? These letters are letters that we'll be studying 2,000 years from now. When you're in heaven, when we're all in heaven, guess what? We'll still have Paul's letters. Paul had no idea that while he was in jail, just being faithful to the Lord, just to still encourage the brethren, still encourage people, still write down instructions to people and send off letters to them. While he was doing that, God was breathing through him the eternal word of God that would, be, that would take on the name of the book of Ephesians, Paul writing to Ephesians, Galatians. Colossians. That's, that's outstanding. Paul had no idea that that was happening, that these letters will be eternal because of the word of God. But that's just a man who's faithful, that God was blessing eternally that he didn't even know what was happening. And once again, bringing it back to you and bringing it back to me. What has God called you to do? Do it and be faithful in it. Be faithful. Be determined to be faithful. Obey him. Obey him to the end, to the extreme, because you don't know all the things that God is opening up and, and making ready and bringing you into by way of blessing, by way of honor, by way of favor, just because you are faithful. Amen. We're out of time for today. We're talking about being faithful. Don't miss out. Don't miss out on some things that God has for you that he didn't tell you about. Obey him. Obey him, whatever it is. Be faithful. And, 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 and enjoy the great things as God has greater things in store for you. If you've never uh, ever asked Jesus into your heart, today's a good day to get saved. What you need to do is ask Jesus to come into your heart. You simply just pray a simple prayer. I've never been born again. Just ask Jesus. Say, Lord, I repent of my sins. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins and you rose again from the dead. And I just ask you to come into my heart and save me. If you pray a prayer just like that, you know what happens? Jesus will come into your heart and he'll save you. And then you can begin to get into the word of God, begin to learn the, the will of God, the general will of God from the word of God, and, and go to a Bible-believing church and do that. And then begin to learn. God will begin to direct you into other areas of life. And I just encourage you to be faithful. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't walk away from where God has you because God has blessings in store for you that's that's beyond what you could ask or think and we'll talk next week about some things until then i am pastor chris turner and this broadcast is called building on the rock peace out